The title of our sermon this morning is Consider Christ and Take Courage. Consider Christ and Take Courage. And this is part two, as we are in John chapter 15, verses 18 through 27. We've been working verse by verse through the Gospel of John. And as we've come to essentially the last night in the Lord's life, the Lord Jesus Christ is giving parting words to his disciples. And this parting instruction, so critical, so important to their future ministry for the Lord Jesus Christ and to ours as we consider the Lord's having left, having ascended into heaven, now seated in his session at the right hand of God the Father, and now we here, left behind, so to speak, on this earth, have a mission to accomplish for him. A great commission that we've been called to. So in John chapter 15, verses 18 to 27 now, the Lord is walking with his disciples on the eve of his execution. They're crossing over the Kidron Valley, going toward the Mount of Olives, up the Mount of Olives, where they're headed toward the Garden of Gethsemane, where the Lord Jesus Christ will be betrayed into the hands of lawless men and arrested. His earthly ministry, to this point, has elicited a rebellious and savage, irrational hatred from the world. Now that hatred is about to reach a boiling point in just a few hours from now where the Lord will be crucified, put to death. Now the Lord knows exactly what he's about to face. We see his agony in the garden as he prays about that to the Father. But now as they're walking along, his concern now is the disciples. The disciples are on his heart and his mind and he intends now, during this conversation with them, to prepare them for all that they're going to face and to prepare them for what his crucifixion and his departure, what it would mean for them. The hatred and persecution will be fierce. They will be sorely tried. They're going to be tempted to fall back. This very night, the night on which he is arrested, they're going to be scattered because of him. Peter, before the night is out, is going to deny him three times. They're going to be racked with doubt, with confusion, with despair, with faithlessness, with cowardice. And all that said, we know that the disciples of Christ are not promised a life of ease. They're promised by the Lord Jesus Christ, hatred from the world. They're promised persecution. And the Lord knows here as he's walking along the Kidron Valley with them that that hatred and persecution will eventually lead to their deaths. Eleven of the disciples martyred for their faith, martyred for their testimony of Christ. One dies in exile. So here, if you can imagine, right, the scene, imagine the conversation that's taking place. The Lord, with a sense of urgency, right, with a sense of concern, all of that communicated by the command to them in verse 20, where he says to them, remember. He commands them to remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they're also going to persecute you. If they kept my word, they'll keep yours also. So that's what we're going to do this morning. As we look at John chapter 15, verses 18 to 27, we want to remember. We're remembering. We're remembering that we're not promised a life of ease. In fact, now is the time for labor. It's not time to take your ease. It's not time to settle into comfort. We've not entered yet that rest that's been promised to us who believe in him. We're to labor. And when you labor in this world for his name, listen, when you labor in this world for his name, you will face persecution. You will face hatred. In Hebrews chapter 12 verse 3 says to us, consider him, consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. That's what the Lord wants them to do. As they're walking along, 
He knows what they're gonna face. And his exhortation to them is to remember, remember his words, remember his example, remember his ministry, and to take courage from that. Don't get discouraged. Don't fall into despair. Don't fall into laziness or apathy or neglect. Take up the charge. Take up the commission. Consider Christ. Take courage and preach the gospel. Consider Christ. Take courage and live for him. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. It's not meant to be easy. Our ease, our rest is coming. But it's on the other side of this life. Like the disciples that are following Christ here in John 15, we're to consider Christ and take courage. Consider Christ and take courage. Let us go forth to him outside the camp and bear his reproach. Don't avoid that. That's a, for the Christian, that's a badge of honor, isn't it? For the Christian, that's our joy to bear his name and the reproach that comes with it for the Christian is a joy, is a blessing. We're to consider Christ and take courage. And not only because of how the Lord Jesus Christ endured the hatred of the world and died, but because of how he endured the hatred of the world and now lives. If you think about the disciples, after the Lord is executed, murdered, what gave the disciples the courageous faith to press on preaching the gospel in the same city that crucified the Lord, in the same world that hated him and crucified him? because Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. They saw the risen Lord. Now you and I are commanded just as they were. You and I are commanded to go and to preach the gospel. Mark chapter 16, we're to go and preach the gospel to every creature, right? Matthew chapter 28, go therefore make disciples. We're commanded to go intentionally, to preach the gospel in a world, to a world that hates it, that despises it, the same world that crucified the Lord. When you do that, you're going to be mocked. You're going to be uncomfortable, right? At times. When you do that, you're going to be scorned. You're going to be hated, disregarded. You're going to be reviled. But our charge is clear, right? And we have the most glorious motivation to be faithful in that charge. We are to love their soul and we are to love the Lord Jesus Christ more than we love our own reputation. We are to love the Lord and love their soul more than we love our own lives. When we die, where are we? <laughs> We've entered our rest. When the Lord is through with us, he calls us home. We're just passing through. Be a fool for Christ's sake, right? And preach the gospel. Be a fool for Christ and preach the gospel. This is a short life. It is but a vapor. Jesus said in John 16, in the world you will have tribulation, but take courage, the Lord says. I have overcome the world. And he lives now, seated at the right hand of the Father in attestation of that fact. And, a, and guarantee that we're going to be resurrected also. We don't serve a dead Christ. We serve a risen Christ. And he who is raised from the dead has promised us, lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. So considering the hatred of this world, considering the persecution that all disciples of Christ will face, how does the Lord here intend to reassure us from the text? That's what he's doing with his disciples here in John 15. He's reassuring them. Warning them of the world's hatred, but reassuring them. How does he reassure us from the text? Well, last week, in point one on your notes, we considered first his example. The example of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 18, like he was hated, you too will be hated in him. That's what he's saying in verse 18. Verse 18, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. In verse 19, like he was sanctified or set apart from the world, you too in him are set apart or sanctified from the world to him. 
Verse 19, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but because I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. In verse 20, like he was persecuted, you too will be persecuted with him. Verse 20, remember, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. Now why? Why did he suffer? Why did he die? Why did he go through all of that? Why did he endure the hatred and cruelty of humanity? Why did he endure the persecution? Why did he leave his heavenly glory to suffer ridicule, to suffer reviling, to suffer blasphemy, to suffer the scorn, suffer the shame, suffer torture, to suffer crucifixion? Well, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 gives us some insight into that. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says that the reason that he did that, suffering even the cross, was because of the joy of Hebrews says, that was set before him. Hebrews 12 says, it was for the joy that was set before him. Now what is that joy? Before you think for a moment that the joy was merely or only redeeming us, you need to think again. Hebrews chapter 12, the joy that was set before him in context there is the joy of his exaltation. The joy of his glory. The glory that he had with God the Father from before the worlds began. The glory that was his in heaven. The glory of Christ. The glory of God the Father. And all that coming, his exaltation in the redemption of wicked rebels like you and I. And now, in Hebrews chapter 12, the joy that the Lord has of being seated. His work finished right? His work accomplished, death overcome, sin overcome, his people, his own, those whom he loved, redeemed to himself, now the joy of having sat down in his session, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, the Lord is there now. <laughs> the Lord is there now. And so now, as you and I, as we run our own race for the joy that is set before us, what's that joy? It's a joy of glory also. Glory in Christ. The joy of having him, right? The joy of having Christ. The joy of going to heaven when we die. We are, as we are running our own race for the joy that is set before us, we are to look to him. Him who is our hope. The author and perfecter of our faith. We're to look to him for help. To him for hope. We're to look to him in faith as we face difficulties. We face tribulation. And we, in light of that great hope, are to lay aside every weight, the author to the letter of Hebrews says. We're to lay aside every weight. We're to lay aside the sin which so easily ensnares us. It's like concrete sometimes around our ankles, right? We're to set aside that sin which so easily ensnares us and we're to run with endurance the race that is set before us. And we follow the example of him who has gone before us, who did all that for us, the one who endured the cross. So understanding his example and how we live the Christian life in light of his example, what should be our response to these things? So we talked about last week, Hebrews 13, verse 13 Therefore, our response is, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. Here, we have no continuing city, but we seek the city that is to come, that which cannot be shaken. Why is it, why is it that we love him? Because he first loved us, that's right. We love him because he first loved us. Why do we pursue him? Why do we seek him in his word? Why do we obey him? Why do we suffer with him? Why do we boldly go into the world and face the same hatred that he faced? Why do we go out with the gospel, which this world hates, and preach that gospel, which will bring to us the same persecution that it brought to him? Why do we do that? Because he's loved us. We are loved in him. We are accepted in the beloved. Because of the great love with which he loved us, right? Why do we love him? Because he loved us. And he loved us in this way, having suffered and died for those who are his own. Why do we do all that? 
because Christ loved us and he loved us in that way. There's a great hymn. I love this hymn that our uh, church sings on a fairly regular basis. And the hymn goes like this. I once was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew the way. The sin that promised joy in life had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own a rebel to your will. And if you had not loved me first, I would refuse you still. But as I ran my hellbound race, indifferent to the cost, you looked upon my helpless state and led me to the cross. And I beheld God's love displayed. You suffered in my place. You bore the wrath reserved for me. And now all I know is grace. And what's our response to that truth? What's our response to it, right? Sing it with me, right? Hallelujah. What? All I have is Christ. Again, hallelujah. Amen. That's our response to that truth. I beheld God's love displayed. He suffered in my place. He suffered in my place. He took that persecution. He faced that scorn. He bore my shame. He bore the wrath reserved for me. And now, nothing but an endless peace. Endless grace. Jesus is my life. But all we have in this world is Christ. And we'll soon go to him. Him goes on. Now Lord, I would now be yours alone and live so all might see that the strength to follow your commands could never come from me. Father, use my ransomed life in any way you choose and let my song forever be my only boast is you. The Lord reassures us in the face of our own persecution, right in the face of the world's hatred, the Lord reassures us that we're in him. The Lord reassures us by his own example. The Lord encourages us by the hope that we have in him. The Lord encourages us, reassures us by heaven. Our portion, Christ, will be ours forever, who we will worship in eternity. God the Father, high, lifted up, praised and worshiped in spirit and in truth, unfettered by sin. That glorious hope should cause us to sell out for Christ. Sell out for Christ in this world. There should be nothing. There should be no creaturely comforts, no inconvenience too great. Consider Christ and take courage. Go forth to him outside the camp and preach the gospel. Next, in your bulletin, point two on your notes. In warning us of the world's hatred, warning us of the world's persecution that we're going to face as we preach the gospel, he calls us to consider the world's response to his own ministry and to take heart with the fact that that will be the world's response to our ministry. <laughs> We're to consider his ministry. Think about it. In verses 21 to 25, the only perfect preacher, <laughs> the only perfect communicator, the one who is perfectly loving, perfectly merciful, right? Perfectly gracious, always had the exactly right word to say. Always. Never too harsh. Never unbalanced. He was perfectly balanced between grace and wrath. You couldn't say of him that he preached too much grace. You couldn't say of him that he preached too much judgment. <laughs> perfect. And that perfect preacher was hated. He was despised and rejected by men. If that's the case for Christ, what does it mean for you when you go out and preach the gospel? When you're faithful with the word of God, faithful to the message, you're going to be persecuted also. Consider his ministry. Look with me at verse 21. All these things, the Lord says, all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, 
because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. You notice that twice in that little section of scripture. They've hated both him and his father. Verse 25, but this happened, all this happened, that the word might be fulfilled which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. But the good news, the gospel, right? The gospel is like a glorious diamond, a multifaceted, shining, crystal, pure, clear, beautiful diamond. All of that against a very black backdrop. The glory of God in the gospel, the holiness of God in the gospel, the righteousness of God in the gospel, the mercy of God, the grace of God, all of that set against the terribly, grotesquely, deplorably back, black backdrop of man's sin, man's corruption. God is holy, you and I are not. And you can't faithfully preach the good news without its context. And we see that happening in the world all over the place, don't we? Someone who goes and just wants to proclaim God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Listen, that is certainly not true of every person, but certainly not the gospel in its context. What are they trying to do? We have these ideas, these notions, men do, right? Worldly wisdom, worldly stinking thinking, not biblical thinking. We have these notions that we can somehow preach the gospel better than Jesus Christ did and get or garner a better response than Jesus Christ did. When you preach the gospel in its context, you are going to be hated. When you preach the gospel in its context, you must preach the good news against the black backdrop of man's sin. You must do that to be faithful with the gospel. The gospel comes in the context of the wickedness of man. And when you say it that way, the world is going to hate you for it. They're going to hate it. Now that hatred for the gospel, hatred specifically for the Lord Jesus Christ, is expressed three ways in verses 21 to 25. We see that hatred first in the world's response to his person in verse 21. Secondly, we see the world's hatred in the world's response to his words in verses 22 and 23. And finally, we see that hatred expressed in the world's response to his works in verses 24 and 25. They hate his person, they hate his words, they hate his works. They hate everything to do with him. Why? Because he says in John chapter 7 that he comes testifying of the world that its works are evil. That's the context for the gospel. Your works are evil and you need a savior. When the Lord testifies of it, that its works are evil, the world hates him for it. Now, let's take a look at that first point, verse 21, the world's response to his person. He says in verse 21, but all these things they will do to you for my name's sake because they do not know him who sent me. And the, world, the world's hatred begins with a hatred of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. All these things in verse 21 at the beginning there refers to the hatred and the persecution that the Lord describes in verses 18 to 20. They're going to hate you and they're going to persecute you. And all these things, verse 21, they will do to you for my name's sake. So the hatred spewed forth by the world in verses 18 and 19. The persecution that's certainly coming for every disciple of Christ, described in verse 20, that hatred, that persecution, now has a cause in verse 21. Jesus says in verse 21, that causes his name. Jesus says, it's because of my name, rightly understood, because of me. These things, verse 21, they're going to do to you because of me. Because of me. Pretty clear, right? Mark chapter 13, verse 9, Mark says of the last days, he says, watch out for yourselves. For they will deliver you up to councils, and you will be beaten in the synagogues, and you will be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, or because of me, the Lord says, for a testimony to them. Now the world's treatment of the Lord's disciples is because the world hates the person of Christ. They hate his name, in other words. The name associated with who he is. They hate everything to do with him. They hate his name, and they're going to hate those who bear his name. 
They're going to hate those who bear his name. And for the genuine Christian, their greatest joy is to bear his name. Right? We've talked about the, the disciples in Acts chapter 5 being beaten and then going away rejoicing that they'd been counted worthy to suffer shame for what? For his name. Suffer shame for his name. You know, you can call me anything in the book as long as you call me his own, right? For Christians, you can endure any name calling as long as you are called by his name, as long as you're his. Now, the reason, the reason for the world's hateful response to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ is given at the end of verse 21. That reason is this, because they do not know him who sent me. In other words, if they had truly known God, they would have responded differently to the revelation of God in his son, Jesus Christ. If they had known God truly, they would have responded differently to the revelation of God in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Their hatred for Christ is damning evidence that they don't know God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul says in verse 7, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known the mysteries of God, had they known God, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And we know from John chapter 5, remember when we're, as we're walking through the gospel of John and we're in John chapter 5, the fourfold witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. In John chapter 5, God testifies of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And God himself said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, right? They heard the audible voice of God at the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ and God testifies of the Lord Jesus Christ. They rejected that witness. In John chapter five, the scriptures testify of Christ. The Lord says, you search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life and these, these scriptures are they which testify of me. They searched their Old Testament looking for eternal life and the Old Testament is pointing to Christ. They rejected that witness and rejected their Messiah. Lastly, it says in John chapter 5, Jesus testifies of himself. Jesus testifies of himself that he is the Christ, the Son of God. And the words of the Lord Jesus Christ bear witness to who he is. Now, how do they respond to his words? Point two, the response to his words in verses 22 and 23. Verse 22. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. So... In response to his words, what do they do? They hate him. They hate him. And because they hate him, they give evidence of hating the Father also. Now the world's hatred, if you think about this for a moment, the world's hatred of Christ is because Christ came and spoke to them. It didn't mean that they were sinlessly perfect before Christ came. They weren't sinlessly perfect. The world is corrupt. The world is evil. Their deeds are evil. Christ now, having come and preached to them, now the world, hearing his words, hates him. It's going to work the same for me and you. If you're here this morning and you profess to be a Christian, but you've lived a quote-unquote comfortable, easy Christian life, it's pretty much all I need to know about you to assess that most likely you're not opening your mouth for Christ. If you preach, if you preach, the world is going to hate you for it. When you speak to them, they're going to respond by rejecting the word of God. They're going to respond with hatred. Some are going to listen to your word. Some are going to obey your word. Like the Lord says, some will keep it also as they've kept his much of the world is going to hate you for it. In that, they're guilty. When you've been given revelation by God, what a grace, what a mercy, right? To hear the gospel preached. I don't know about you, I spent a vast majority of my life having never heard the biblical gospel. I can think, now I'm an old guy at this point, right? <laughs> right? But I can remember twice 
twice in my entire life that anyone ever came to me and even attempted to preach. They didn't preach the gospel, but they made an attempt. One guy handed me a tract and he's like, do you think you're a Christian? I'm like, yes. And that was it. He walks off, right? I got the tract. I didn't read it, but he gave me a tract. Remember the other time I was walking uh, through a, an event, this uh, event that goes on here in Oviedo. When I was lost and someone came up to me and they asked me, what would you say to God when you stand before him? What are you going to say to him? I said, hi, God. <laughs> uh, what would you have God say to you? I hope he'll say it to me. Well, well done, you know, good. And I'm lost. That's all I knew to say. Well done, good and faithful servant. And that was it. That was the end of the conversation. My entire life, no one ever really preached the biblical gospel to me until I came to this church. There's no other excuse for that but that professing Christians aren't faithful with the commission they've been given. Genuine Christians, genuine Christians can't help but preach the gospel. Right? Paul said, I believed, therefore I spoke. I believed, therefore I spoke. We've been given this ministry and see so much evidence within modern day evangelicalism of people who are ashamed of the gospel. They're ashamed of the response that it gets from the world. And so what do they do? They water it down. They change the message. They refuse to preach it. And in those churches where that happens, you get grace, 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 love, 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 love. Love trumps everything. You don't get the gospel. It's as easy as A, B, C. Just admit you're a sinner. Believe in Christ and confess. Right? No repentance They have no excuse for their sin. We have the revelation of God in our laps, right? We have the word of God in our laps. We have no excuse, no excuse. The Jews at this time claimed to love God, but they accused Jesus Christ of being demon-possessed. Like those today who claim to love God, but believe that Jesus is a created being or believe that Jesus is just a man, or would say that Jesus Christ is not God. They hate the self-revelation of Christ, that he is God in the flesh, just like the Jews at that time who claim to love God, they see Jesus Christ as something other than he is, and they prove themselves to hate Jesus and hate God. Luke 8, verse 18, Luke says, Therefore, take heed how you hear for whoever has, to him more will be given. And whoever does not have, even what he seems to have, will be taken from him. They respond to the person of Christ with hatred. They respond to his words with hatred. Lastly, Jesus says in John chapter 5, the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do, those works bear witness of me. Well, how do they respond to his works? In verses 24 and 25, the Lord says, If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, same thing, right? They would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. But this has happened that the word might be fulfilled which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. His words and his works testify of who he is. They testify of his person. The world hates his person, hates his words, and rejects his works. Hate his works. He is, the Lord Jesus Christ, is God in the flesh. He is the Lamb of God, the Messiah, the one who has come to take away the sin of the world. But the Jews, so blinded by, we've seen this as we walk through the gospel, right? The Jews, so blinded by Christ, so blinded by their hatred for Christ, their hatred for his message, that even the works that he did, the miraculous works that he did, were attributed to Satan rather than to God. Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse 11, he says, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. The Lord is saying, believe me. And if you won't believe me, believe the works that I do. If you remember from John chapter 3, Nicodemus, all the way back in John chapter 3, Nicodemus saying, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. The Pharisees knew they would not believe. They saw the works 
and they rejected Christ, giving evidence that their blinding hatred had blinded them from both God the Son and God the Father. And in that, they've got no excuse. Verse 24, they have no excuse. They're guilty. They're guilty for having rejected the light they've been given. Now think about this for a moment in the ministry of Christ. Jesus, in John chapter 9, gives sight to a man born blind, attested to by everyone. The Pharisees, if you remember John chapter 9, go on this diligent hunt for evidence to the contrary. But this man was born blind, and the Lord Jesus Christ gave him his sight. In John chapter 11, among many other miracles, right? In John chapter 11, the Lord Jesus Christ raises Lazarus from the dead. An unquestionable miracle. If you remember, Lazarus is in the tomb four days, and what do they say of Lazarus? He stinketh. <laughs> He's dead. And the Lord Jesus Christ raises Lazarus from the dead. The Pharisees knew that these miracles were true. They were undeniable. And all that, they rejected those miracles as having been done by God, through Jesus Christ, by Jesus Christ, in God the Father. They rejected both the Son, rejected the Father, and in that, the Lord is saying they're guilty. They're culpable for having rejected the revelation that they've been given. Turn with me for an example of this now to Matthew chapter 11. I want to make the application for us. Matthew chapter 11. They're guilty for having rejected the revelation that they've been given. If you're familiar in Scripture with the unpardonable sin, We've all heard that before, the unpardonable sin. Essentially, the unpardonable sin, being blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, the unpardonable sin is essentially rejecting or refusing to believe, attributing the message, the words, the works, the person of Christ to Satan, right? It's rejecting the fullest possible revelation that you're going to have from God. God essentially gives a revelation of himself. And he gives that in the, in the person, the work, the words of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. When a person has been given as much revelation from God as they're going to be given, at that point you're done. Romans chapter 1, you're given over to a debased mind. You're given over to that which you want. You want your sin. You want your life. You're given over. It's called the sin or the, the wrath of God's abandonment. And essentially, the unpardonable sin is just you've rejected the sum total of the revelation you're going to have from God. And at that point, you're done. When you reject light, when you stand in judgment over light, when you reject or rebel against the light you've been given, there is a consequence. Matthew chapter 11, look down at verse 20. The Lord preaching begins in verse 20 to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. He had done these miracles, right, throughout Judea. And they didn't repent. Verse 21, the Lord says, Woe, woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. Why? <laughs> Why? Because of their rejection of all of that revelation that they've been blessed with. It's a grace of God, right? When the gospel's preached to you, it's the grace of God. When you go out and preach the gospel, it's the grace of God to you, certainly. But it's the grace of God to that person you're preaching to. I've thought about that many times standing at the door. I've gone my entire life my entire life, and no one came to my door and preached the gospel like I'm preaching it to this person at the door. What a grace. What a mercy of God. The goodness of God. The compassion of God to bring the gospel to that person. What a grace. What a blessing. Take heed how you hear, right? You reject that. I've often asked someone at the door before, how many times have you ever had a conversation like this? And a vast majority of the times it's like, never. <laughs> never. These cities had been blessed they heard his preaching. They saw his miracles. They had the, the Lord of glory among them. They witnessed his power. And yet in spite of all that revelation, they rejected him. They hated him. They hated his message. They attributed his works to Satan. And Jesus used these cities, Bethsaida, Chorazin. He used these cities to emphasize 
how his own people had rejected him. All those people had said, uh, we're all children of God, right? We're sons of our father Abraham, and yet they rejected God when God was among them. And he said that it would be more tolerable in that day for Tyre and Sidon, the day of judgment, it'll be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon than for you. Now consider that in our context today. We have so much revelation given to us. We have the complete Bible in our hands. The revelation, all the revelation at this point that God intends for us to have is contained in his word. He has spoken in times past to the fathers by the prophets, but to us, he's spoken to us in his son. We have the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's come into the world. He's died at Calvary's cross for sinners. We have that revelation given to us. What will you do with it? What will you do with it? Back in John chapter 15, verse 25, even this, this hateful and rebellious rejection serves God's purposes. Look at verse 25. This happened, verse 25, so that the word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. It says there, in their law, it's the law, but it's their law. It's the law that they profess to be given to. <laughs> it's the law that is theirs. They profess to be oracles, recipients of the law of God. It's their law. Even in that law, the law testifies of the Lord Jesus Christ. They've rejected him, the Jesus Christ of the scriptures. And all that happened in accord with that law, which they testify to be their own. This happened, verse 25, that the word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. This statement in their own law, this statement has come true. Psalm chapter 109, listen to this from the psalmist. He says in verse 1, Do not keep silent, O God of my praise. For the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful have opened against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. They have also surrounded me with words of hatred and they fought against me without a cause. In return for my love, they are my accusers that I give myself to prayer. Thus, they have rewarded me evil for good and hatred for my love. When you think about Christ, right? You think about that psalm. The psalm that he's quoting here in John chapter 15, also Psalm 39, Psalm 65. When you think about that psalm, when you think about the Lord Jesus Christ and what the Lord Jesus Christ has done, it's stunning, right? It's staggering that anyone would reject the Lord. It's stunning that the world hates him. If Jesus Christ had come and the Lord was malicious or the Lord was mean-spirited, right? The Lord was arrogant. If he were harsh, if he were self-serving, but the Lord didn't come that way. The Lord came because of the great love with which he loved us. And they accused him. And they hated him and they rejected him. They rewarded his good with evil. They rewarded his love with hatred. Is there anyone more loving than the Lord Jesus Christ? It's amazing, isn't it? Now, when you and I go out to preach the gospel, if you and I go out harsh and unloving, if you and I go out maliciously, or mean-spirited, if you and I go out self-servingly or arrogant or proud, then we have every reason, don't we, to reap the world's rejection of us. <laughs> so we need to be careful that when we go out, we go out as the Lord went out, speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth, but speaking the truth in love. Isaiah said, let the wicked forsake his way the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and the Lord will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. That's the grace and compassion of the Lord. Joel chapter two. Now therefore says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping and with mourning over your sin, right? So rend your heart, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God for he is gracious. The Lord is merciful. The Lord is slow to anger. He's of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. 
Jesus himself says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, come to me. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Lord is not offering winter breaking up of stones in Siberia. <laughs> this is good news. This is rest and hope. He is gentle and lowly. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. John says, In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Apart from Him, we face death. We face eternal torment in hell apart from Christ. But Christ has come. And the love of God manifested toward us in that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. The wrath-satisfying sacrifice for our sins. The wrath of God. If you're outside of Christ, the wrath and condemnation of God hangs over your head justly. You deserve to go to hell when you die because of your sin, because you've rebelled against him. He made you for his glory and from your birth, you have failed to live up to that purpose for which you were created. You have rejected him. You have rebelled against him. The sin of rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft in God's sight. You're an enemy of God by your wicked works. And yet in all of that, the love of God is manifested toward you in this fact that the Lord Jesus Christ came into the world. That God sent forth his only begotten son so that you might live through him. What grace, what compassion, what mercy, what goodness, what love. And yet the Lord, the world, the world won't hear won't hear, they hate the idea that I need a wrath-satisfying sacrifice. Why? Because my deeds are wicked. You, apart from Christ, are evil. You're wicked. It's the total depravity of man. And that's why Christ came in love, in compassion, in mercy, in grace, to be your propitiation. If you'll repent and put your faith and trust in him. You know, if you're here today and you're not a Christian, listen to me, young man, young woman, old man, old woman, listen to me. If you're here today and you are not a Christian, then you're going to have to deal with your guilt, with the extent of your guilt. Not only the guilt of your sin, but the guilt of your sinful rejection of Christ to this point. It will be more tolerable in the day of judgment for most men than it will be for you. Because of the light that you've been given. The light that you have right now. You're here today. You're hearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're hearing of his mercy. You're hearing the good news. You're here today as witnesses of the power of God in the gospel to save sinners. I'm not the same man I once was. If you're in Christ, you're not the same man. You're not the same woman that you were, once were either. Why? Because of the gospel, because of the gospel, because of the Lord Jesus Christ, the spirit of God indwelling you, God taking out your heart of flesh, your heart of stone, and replacing it with a heart of flesh. God putting off the old man, putting on a new man, making you a new creation in him. Take heed how you hear, repent and believe in the gospel. Follow Christ. Mark says this in chapter eight. Mark says, when he had called the people to himself, with his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Let him deny himself, take up his cross, the instrument of his own execution, and let him follow me, the Lord says. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's, 
hear the Lord Jesus Christ. Whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So what should our response be to all of this? The world has rejected his person. The world has rejected his word. The world has rejected his works. What should be our response to this reality? Point three on your notes. Take courage in him. He's overcome the world. The Lord Jesus Christ has overcome the world. Take courage in him. Look back in John 15 at verse 26. Verse 26, the Lord says, but when the helper comes, that's the parakletos, the Holy Spirit, right? Right? When the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of truth, he will testify of me. You know, the, the courage that we need, brother, sister, right? The courage that we need to run our race. The courage that we need to be faithful with the gospel. The courage that we need to get off the couch and witness to somebody, right? The courage that we need to take up our commission is not something that we can simply conjure up within ourselves. It's not that you, by yourself in your own strength, can reach down, grab your bootstraps, right? And pull yourself up and motivate you to get out and go. Get out and witness. Get out to obey the Lord. Fight sin. Read your Bible. Pray. It's not something that we can conjure up in ourselves. We need the helper to come. We need the spirit of truth that proceeds from the Father. We need him. Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 talks about those who went before us, our brothers and sisters, who were martyred for the faith. It talks about them as having been made strong out of weakness. You and I, we need to be constantly made strong out of weakness. Amen? We can't do this in our own strength. We need to be made strong out of weakness. They didn't make themselves strong. They made themselves available. They made themselves available and God made them strong. And think about it in your battle with sin. In your battle with sin. Make yourselves available to the word of God. Make yourselves available to the means of grace, of the grace of God in Christ. Make yourselves available in prayer. Make yourselves available to fight and God in your weakness will make you strong. When you go out to preach the gospel, you're going out in weakness. Trust him. Put your faith and trust in him. It's God who makes you strong. You are to make yourself available and you depend upon God to make yourself strong. It's in the power of God's might that all of those martyrs that went before us, it's in the power of God's might that they were made strong. The Spirit is your help. The Spirit of God will testify. It will testify of the world, of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The Spirit of God can testify in this world apart from God's people, but he doesn't testify always apart from God's people, and God's people can never say that they testify apart from the Spirit of God. You need the Spirit of God. First, the Spirit is your help, verse 26. Secondly, the gospel is your charge. Look at verse 27. And you also... And you also will bear witness because you've been with me from the beginning. You know, in the context in verse 27, the verb there, will bear witness, in the context is not a future. It's not you will, as in some future point, bear witness. The word is actually an imperative, a command. Better translated, you must bear witness. If the Spirit of God, verse 26, is in the world testifying of the Lord Jesus Christ, then it is incumbent upon you to testify also. You must testify also. You also will bear witness. You must. The reason for that is because you've been with him from the beginning. Now he's speaking of his disciples here in John chapter 15 who had been with him from the beginning. Right? But it's always been said of the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, they've been with Jesus. They've been with Jesus. Right? When the Rulers, the Pharisees, the scribes, saw those that had been with Jesus. They perceived that they were uneducated men, but they remembered <laughs> they'd been with Jesus, right? 
You can walk up to someone in a matter of moments in a conversation, sense a kindred spirit with a genuine believer and say, that guy's been with Jesus. Amen? There's just something about it. God knits us together. We share the same faith. We share the same spirit. One Lord, one baptism. Here, because the spirit testifies, you also must testify. And the Lord has been with you from the beginning. When you were genuinely saved and the Lord indwelt you with your spirit, he said, he promised to you, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. There are only two groups of people here. If you think about verses 26 and 27, our charge by the Lord here to take courage in him with the gospel and to bear witness for the Lord Jesus Christ, it delineates two groups of people. One, witnessing disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ who are willing to suffer for him. Witnessing disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ who go forth to him outside the camp bearing his reproach. Those who believe and because of their belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, those who speak. That's one group. The other group is the world. Evil and condemned. Two groups of people. According to John chapter 15, verses 18 to 27. This is the reality of our commission, folks. You'll hear many that will say today, doing all kinds of hermeneutical gymnastics to get around the truth that every Christian is an evangelist. That's your commission. Every Christian is commanded by God, the Lord Jesus Christ, to whom has been given all authority... All authority has been given to him in heaven and on earth. He tells every Christian to go. To go and to make disciples. To go preach the gospel. You've been given a commission. There are only two groups of people. Witnessing disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ willing to suffer for his name, suffer for their faith, and the world. The objects of that evangelism. And who is evil and condemned. It's interesting that the word in verse 27, if you look at that word, bear witness, the words bear witness in verse 27 translate the Greek word martyreo, martyreo. It's the Greek word from which we derive our English word martyr, right? Martyr. That's interesting to me in thinking about that word. How is it that a word that simply meant witness in the Greek come to be associated with suffering, persecution, and death. It's a word that means witness. How did a word that simply means witness come to be understood from our perspective in our modern English language to be a word associated with suffering, with persecution, and with death? It's associated with that because of the way the world treats Christians. The way the world has always treated Christians and the way the world will treat you. Settle it in your heart and mind, folks. I, I, you know, we have to be resolved of that. When you go to witness, fear God more than fearing that man. Fear God more than fearing that woman. Take up his commission and just preach the gospel. Settle it in your heart and mind. You're going to be hated. You're going to be reviled. Your message is going to be rejected. But there's some who are going to heed your word. And you and I in this room are testimonies of that fact. And there are some of you, when you first heard the gospel, what did you do? You hated it. <laughs> They've stormed, I saw a couple of you, storming out of the front doors of this church, <laughs> hating what you heard. But you couldn't argue with it. And you knew what the Bible said is true. And you knew the Lord Jesus Christ is gracious and merciful. And you knew what it meant that he suffered and bled on the cross. You knew what it meant for him to die for sinners. And you finally, after having the Lord breaking through that packed, reinforced concrete around your heart, you finally came to the understanding, I need a savior. And you turned from that wicked life, you turned from living for yourself, and you put all of your hope, all of your trust, all of your faith in him. You know, Christians... When you think about the word martyr, 
always for Christians, right? Always for Christians. It's not a, an acknowledgement of the sacrifice of the Christian of their own life, right? Though if you think about the word martyr and where that word comes from, martyreo, being spoken of as being a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. A martyr is someone who gives their life for the sacrifice of someone else. It's the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. The sacrifice of the Lord suffered for his own. And when you do that, when you bear witness for him with the gospel, they're going to hate you. You will be persecuted. Matthew chapter 10 this is our charge. This is our commission. The Lord says, whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. What you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. Therefore, in light of all of that glorious truth, therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. You know, friendship with the world, the Bible says, is hatred toward God. Friendship with the world is hatred toward God. Would you rather be, would you rather be hated by the world and loved by God? Or would you rather be loved by this world and hated by God. That's a no-brainer, right? Look with me at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Here is the author to this letter is recounting the Spirit of God, recounting the examples of faith throughout redemptive history, he comes to verse 32. Having given all these examples of faith, he says in verse 32, and what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through a courageous faith, right? Through faith, through faith they subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, so they might obtain a better resurrection. That's faith, right? That's a courageous faith. You know, there are, there are many martyrs who die blindly for some absurd faith. A blind faith. We don't have an unsettled, undetermined, indeterminate hope. Our hope is resolved. Our hope is determined. Lord Jesus Christ has won. He's won the victory. He's overcome the world. And so these didn't accept deliverance. They were by the power of the Spirit and the Spirit of God, able to reject that easy deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Verse 36, still others had a trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts, and mountains, and dens, and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us, they should not be made perfect apart from us. Therefore, chapter 12, verse 1. We also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of... It's not just a few, right? Right? You're not looking at a stadium that is 
sparsely populated, <laughs> big sections of empty seats, the entire upper deck empty. This is a packed stadium. We're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. We also now, surrounded by that great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. Take off the mud-filled, waterlogged boots. Take them off your feet, right? Take off the laden down, heavy garments. Lay aside every weight. Lay aside the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And we need to reason together from this text. Lay aside, lay aside every notion that the Christian life is going to be easy. Lay aside every thought, every idea that the Christian life can be lived without cost. It cannot. It cannot. Lay aside every notion that the Christian life can be lived without inconvenience to you, without a disturbance to your schedule without a reshifting, a reprioritizing of your priorities. It cannot lay aside every idea that the Christian life can be lived apart from the world's hatred, the world's persecution. And we are called to face it all in faith. The end of all that, the end of our faith, is that the Lord Jesus Christ calls us home. We're called home. So now, while we're here, lay aside every weight Lay aside the sin which so easily ensnares us and run your race. Run with endurance, the race set before you. Don't lose heart. Don't get lazy along the way. Verse 2, look to Jesus, the author and the finisher, the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and now he has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You and I must have a courageous, faith-filled determination to go forth to him outside the camp and bear witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. And Christians have been given everything they need to do just that. We have everything that we need. So what would cause you and I, as we consider these things, what would cause you and I to wax and wane in our commitment? What causes you and I to be neglectful of that charge or to be cowardly or to be apathetic with it. One, maybe consider your own heart. It may be a loss of conviction. You just don't believe it like you once believed it. Maybe you don't believe it. A loss of conviction will cause you to lack in zeal for the grace of God and the gospel. Maybe it's a lack of the fear of God. You don't fear him who can cast both body and soul into hell. Maybe it's a lack of love for the Lord Jesus Christ. If you love the Lord and all that the Lord has done for you, then you'll preach the gospel. That's what saved your soul. And you'll be zealous to preach that which can save someone else. Maybe it's too much love for your own life too much love for your own comforts, too much love for your own priorities, your own time, your own desires. You know, comfort, which we are plagued with today, comfort gives rise to temptation. When you're comfortable, you're going to be tempted. Temptation with comfort gives rise to selfishness, self-indulgence, satisfying yourself. And many Christians believe they can have the gospel and have that life. It's a temptation. You're at a war to rage against that temptation. I'm here to preach the gospel for Christ. And Jim Elliot, Jim Elliot was a, 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 a martyr, was killed for the faith, murdered for the faith. And Jim Elliot had a saying that has been uh, impactful on me as I thought about it this week. Jim, Jim Elliot's statement, he says, he is no fool to give what he cannot keep in order to gain what he cannot lose. 
He is no fool to give that which he cannot keep, his life, right? To gain what he cannot lose, Christ. Don't be a fool. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I praise you. We worship you. We thank you, Lord. Thank you for um, the Lord Jesus Christ, his person, his words, his works, all that he has done, his substitution on our behalf, his propitiation, Lord, his wrath-satisfying sacrifice, his atonement for sinners. We praise you and thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for the good news that in him, through repentant faith, sinners can be justified before God. Sinners can be forgiven. Well, we praise you and thank you that we've been forgiven in him. That in him, we've been made free. In him, all of our sin has been cast into the depths of the sea. And we praise you, God, that in him, we are seen as righteous in your eyes. We thank you, Lord, for that glorious blessing. Lord, give us a, a conviction of those things unseen that by faith we might preach your gospel until you call us home. Counting the shame, counting the persecution, counting the hatred and reviling of this world as a blessing, as a privilege. Knowing, Lord, that you've said when we suffer for Christ's sake, we have a blessing, we have a reward. We thank you for those glorious promises. Strengthen us by your spirit to do it. Lord, help us to be faithful to you in this. Lord, help us not to neglect these things. We desire from the heart that Jesus Christ would receive the full reward of his suffering. And we count it a joy to go outside the camp, going forth to him, to suffer with him. For the joy that is set before us, just as he did for us, for the joy that was set before him, we praise you and thank you for that joy. We love you, Lord. Thank you for these dear brothers and sisters. Thank you, Lord, for the joy that it is to serve alongside them in the gospel. For your name's sake, it's in that name that we pray. Amen. Right.